times, but in 1200 BC it actually happened, and no one saw it coming. Some of the greatest civilizations of the age were wiped out in a single generation. Everything comes crashing down. What happened at the end of the 13th century is still a mystery. This was the disaster recorded in Homer's Iliad and Odyssey and in the books of Joshua and Judges in the Old Testament. But what caused this epic destruction? Is it human? Is it Mother Nature? It is a debate that has raged for decades. But new archaeological evidence found among ancient ruins on mountaintops may finally shed light on the source of this ancient cataclysm. For archaeologists, the past is illustrated by the objects left behind. The treasures of Tutankhamun's tomb. The toppled towers of mighty Greek palaces at Knossos. And pottery and stone reliefs that depict both vast riches and endless warfare. This was the ancient world of 1300 BC. The Bronze Age, named after the metallurgy of its weapons. Stretching from Egypt to the Black Sea, the ancient world was an amalgam of disparate and powerful nations, dominated by kings and their armies. The Mycenaeans and Minoans, the heroes of Homeric legend, built their palaces in Greece, Crete and the Aegean Islands. The pharaoh Ramses, thought to be the pharaoh cited in the Old Testament, changed the very landscape with his monument at Karnak. The warring Hittites, biblical enemies of Egypt, dominated what is now Turkey and northern Syria. While the Canaanites, the merchants of the great trade route, controlled what was to become the Holy Land, Israel, Lebanon and Jordan. It was a patchwork of many kingdoms, leagues apart, distinct in design and culture. Yet when archaeologists first began excavating this territory in the 1930s, a disturbing pattern began to emerge. What we've got is a series of destructions. Most of the main cities, towns, palaces are destroyed for one reason or another. Evidence of destruction was widespread, and in nearly every instance, the period of the collapse was the same the years surrounding 1200 BC. In this 50-year period, we've got uh, at least four major civilizations that go down. Mycenaeans disappear, Minoans disappear, Hittites disappear, the Canaanites to a large extent disappear, and Egypt is so weakened that it's really never the same again. That's what's so amazing about this is these are the biggest guys in the world, and they all bite the dust at about the same time within a generation or two. The Ramesid period starts off very strong with some of the most spectacular building and, and just incredible wealth. And then there are little cracks in the whole fabric of the society, economically, religion. You can just see things sort of going downhill. In the reign of Ramses III, there's tremendous inflation. We see the monuments become smaller in scale. We also see huge economic problems with the tax base of the country because so much of the taxable land had been removed from the tax rolls. Many people believe that from this time the Egyptians no longer have the great self-confidence they had before the gods. We see a whole new genre of petitions to the gods, these prayers asking for, for you know, please God help me, which we never saw before this time. After a century of progress, which saw the development of the first alphabetic writing in Ugarit in 1300 and the first musical notation in Syria, the written record abruptly ended. What followed has become known, ominously, as the Dark Age. The Dark Ages in the Aegean and Eastern Mediterranean have two connotations. One is, for the ancients, they lost most of the hallmarks of civilization. It's called that in part because civilization as we know it disappears for a couple of hundred years. They forget how to write in Greece. They forget how to uh, do large buildings, massive architecture. 
and it takes two or three hundred years to come up out of this. But it's also a dark period for us. Without written records, archaeologists were baffled by the evidence of mass migrations throughout the ancient world, all dating to around 1200 BC. On the island of Crete, tradesmen and merchants poured out of the coastal settlements and pushed inland to the mountainous lands worked by farmers and shepherds. In the North Isthmus, the area right behind uh, me here, it appears that there was almost no settlement at all, or perhaps a small scattering of, of small villages in the, uh, in the Mycenaean period. The population is very thin. By the 12th century, the population grows considerably. But where this population is coming from and why exactly is not entirely clear. The destruction in the cities they left behind is mute testimony that this was no peaceful exodus. It can be very difficult to determine the cause of a destruction. When you're digging, it's pretty obvious something's been destroyed. You've got fire, you've got ash, you've got burnt wood, you've got skeletons. But what actually caused the destruction? The answer may not lie in the rubble of these palaces, but in the mountains high above them. One archaeologist has dedicated his life to following the clues, rediscovering the ancient pathways that lead up the sheer cliffs of the Aegean. It is here that he follows in the footsteps of the survivors, hoping at last to discover how and why their world collapsed. For decades, it remained a mystery. The sudden collapse of the great coastal cities and palaces of the ancient world in 1200 BC. What could have caused it? Most investigators dug for clues in the ruins of mighty cities. But the real evidence was to be found further inland in the distant mountains and valleys of the Aegean Islands, where humble farmers and shepherds once cultivated barley, lentils and olives. It first came to light in the summer of 1983, when Polish archaeologist Krzysztof Nowitzki, then a 26-year-old student, first climbed the mountain of Kafi on the island of Crete. Nowitzki's original goal was to study a Neolithic religious shrine constructed on Kafi's summit by prehistoric peoples. But once there, 1,200 meters above sea level, Nowitzki was drawn to another set of ruins. A mountaintop village that had been partially excavated and abandoned by the British archaeologist John Pendlebury in the 1930s. Having experienced one of the frigid winters on top of Kafi, Pendlebury concluded it was merely a temporary or seasonal settlement. But to Nowitzki, the ruins made of large blocks of stone suggested something else. What is interesting about the houses in Kafi is that they are pretty well constructed. This way of construction suggests that these people were prepared to live in this village for a long time and that these were their permanent houses. By mapping out and reconstructing the settlement from the excavated footprint, Nowitzki confirmed his suspicion. The excavation revealed at least 25 to 30 houses. At the moment, these remains are in a very bad state of preservation, but we still can trace the walls and we still can trace the rooms and particular individual houses. Karafi was a big village. It was not a small settlement. It was a village inhabited probably by 120 to 150 families, about 600 to 1200 people. The reconstructed village, 1100 meters above sea level, seemed strangely out of place. We should not expect a big village situated on this rock and uh, on such altitude. Now we are sitting in the sun, there is probably 35 degrees. But 
if we came here in the winter, it is a very, very windy, very cold place. It is not very pleasant to live here. Why would there be a permanent settlement so far above the usual sites on the lower hillsides and plains? We have to ask why people move to these places, why people build their houses in the places difficult to climb up, why they decided to move their families to these houses, why they moved their entire economic system up to these places, to the high mountains. Though Pendlebury had thought it an earlier site, Novitsky's carbon dating of pottery and other artifacts placed it squarely in the time of the Bronze Age catastrophe, 1200 BC. Before 1200 BC, we still have people living close to the sea, on the plains, in the valleys. Shortly before 1200 BC, we see that many of these low-situated places were either destroyed or abandoned. The inevitable question was, what would force these populations to move from the coasts to the mountains? Novitsky returned to the historical and archaeological record, but could find no consensus as to what had caused such sudden and dramatic changes. There are all kinds of crazy theories out there to explain the end of the Late Bronze Age. Comets, volcanoes, aliens, you name it, people have said it. But most hypotheses revolved around the ever-present threat of natural disaster. One of the main suggestions has been drought, that there was a major drought across the entire Aegean and Eastern Mediterranean, and perhaps even up to Europe and that starts tribes migrating. The level of the water of the Mediterranean had dropped significantly at the end of the Late Bronze Age. Another possibility was the devastating earthquakes that regularly jolt the region. We've got a number of sites in the Aegean and Eastern Mediterranean destroyed by earthquake within a 50-year span at the end of the Late Bronze Age. Mycenae is destroyed by earthquake. Troy 6 is destroyed by earthquake. Ugarit may be destroyed by an earthquake. Megiddo and Israel may be destroyed by an earthquake. The problem with saying that a single earthquake destroyed all of these sites and brought the Late Bronze Age to an end is that these sites are destroyed at different times during the 50-year period. Though the timing of the earthquakes differs, they could still be related. There is something that geophysicists today call an earthquake sequence or an earthquake storm in which an earthquake will not relieve all of the stress in a fault but will simply release part of the stress and so the next part in the fault will go a year later ten years later and then the fault unzips from east to west or west to east or north to south and we eventually get what's called an earthquake sequence or an earthquake storm and these last between 30 and 60 years. Many of the cities that are destroyed by earthquakes are either on a fault line or in a seismically active zone. In fact, if you lay a map of the sites that are destroyed at the end of the Late Bronze Age by earthquake, on top of a map of seismically active zones, they will correlate on very nearly a one-to-one -one basis. But the earthquake theory has always had its detractors. People recover from earthquakes fairly quickly. That's, that's, pretty, that, that's pretty much proven. <laughs> um, even repeated earthquakes. And to Novitsky, no natural disaster could explain why a population should move to an even more precarious place. There's no way that people would move their village 1,100 meters to the top of this rock. Why? Escaping from the earthquakes and living on the edge of the rock? We don't see the people running away from natural disasters. So it makes no sense. 
Novitsky believes that these unlikely and inhospitable heights are a place of last resort, a defensible refuge designed to offer protection not from nature, but from a human enemy. I mean, there is no reason to live on the ledges, hanging above the gorge or on the rocky knolls, other than a real threat from some other people. If Novitsky's theory about the Aegean apocalypse is correct, there should be dozens of refuge sites waiting to be discovered in the high mountains of Crete, hidden settlements unseen for generations. If he can find them, they could reveal details of a life and death struggle between the survivors who subsisted at these impossible heights and the enemy that drove them there. There are many theories as to what could have caused the apocalypse of 1200 BC and destroyed the mighty Bronze Age civilizations of the Hittites, Canaanites, Mycenaean and Minoans. Some have blamed natural disasters, disease and pestilence, even the wrath of an angry god. But could it have had a human cause? And if so, who were the people that sent such mighty cultures crashing down within the span of a single generation? For decades, archaeologists sifted the abundant ruins but found only a few isolated clues. Then, in the 1930s, a stone tablet bearing a desperate message was unearthed in northern Syria. Found in the ruins of the palace of Ugarit, destroyed by fire around 1200 BC, it gave a foretaste of the destruction to come. The king of Ugarit says, my father, seven enemy ships have been sighted. Now, they've already done great damage to my country. If you see any more, please let me know. The tablet was never sent. It was found in the kiln, ready to be fired, when, obviously, the enemy ships came back and destroyed the town. Who was this enemy that came from the sea? Only one culture, Egypt, survived the collapse of the Bronze Age to give them a name. Ancient hieroglyphics tell of a terrifying foe, the warriors known only as the Sea Peoples. We get all of our details about what the Sea Peoples look like and their mode of transportation from the Egyptians. In addition to the texts that the Egyptians put up on their walls, they also put up pictorial scenes. And so they actually show us what the Sea Peoples look like. We can see the type of helmets they wear, the type of headdresses they wear. We can see them moving in ox carts, in some cases with their families, wives and children and possessions. This was a mass movement that was affecting all the ancient cultures of the Eastern Mediterranean. And this was something that had never happened before. Every single culture in that area, even the ones as well established and as powerful as Egyptians, were being really shaken by this movement of the Sea People. Because part of it is they were coming not only to attack, but to settle. This is what archaeologist Christoph Nowitzki had envisioned when he first looked at the ruins high on Kafi, a desperate people, the shepherds and farmers of the valleys driven into the mountains they knew so well. But could he prove that Kafi was no anomaly, simply one example in the systematic evacuation of an entire people? Nowitzki has spent more than 20 years putting his theory to the test. Travelling alone, and with only the most minimal of supplies, he methodically scaled mountain tops so steep that he often had to cling to the cliff face or find ancient footholds carved into the rock to counter the treacherous shifting beds of loose shale. And it is here, at these improbable heights, that he found what has been his greatest discovery, the mountaintop settlement of Catalimata. The site can only be reached by ascending an incline of loose stone, then clinging to an almost invisible path along the cliff face. In 1990, American archaeologist Donald Haggis accompanied him as a witness. 
This one is extraordinary. The site itself is built on these sharply formed precipitous limestone cliffs above the plain and you have to get to it by climbing a scree slope and then entering the gorge from the outer face by a narrow entrance path. The artifacts found at the site reveal a people living on the edge. These simple country inlanders, shepherds and farmers by trade, would have had to move all their possessions one by one up these steep mountain trails. The old and the infirm would have had to have been carried, their dead buried in tombs carved out of the mountaintops. Livestock and crops in the valleys below could only be tended when conditions were safe enough. The evidence that we recovered during surveys suggests that they were using the settlement probably for a considerable period. It's an uncomfortable site to live in. It's not conducive to settlement expansion. Though life on Catalemata would have been extremely difficult, it had one advantage, security. This place is, it can be a nightmare for strangers, for foreigners. Uh, without the, this knowledge of local topography, it's really very difficult to climb them and find them. They're like fortresses, in a sense, utilizing the natural terrain. And sometimes, as a lot of research out here is showing, not just utilizing the terrain, but utilizing fairly effective fortification walls as well. Any enemy trying to invade the settlement would have been visible for miles, allowing the mountain people time to prepare. The invaders themselves would have been forced to approach single file, unable to hold their weapons while clinging to the cliff face. Even if they found a way, then it was very easy to stop them. Even a few men could stop a much stronger group of, of intruders, of enemies, here on these narrow ledges. Catalemata was only the first of many refuge sites that Novitsky has discovered. After scaling nearly 2,000 mountains in Crete, he has identified 80 different refuge sites dating to 1200 BC. One common unifying factor in the orientation and design of these settlements has convinced him that they were built to withstand the Sea Peoples. How do we know that these people were afraid of the people coming from the sea and not that they were afraid of their neighbors? This can be done only by analyzing how the settlements were defended. Perfi is completely open from the area of the mountains behind it. So we know that they didn't expect the enemy coming from these mountains. These places were settled because they were afraid of the people coming from the sea. The influx of these sea peoples was to change the face of the ancient world. So who exactly were they? In a memorial carved at Medinet Habu, the Egyptians identify nine factions of sea peoples, a list that baffles linguists. Most of the theories about where the sea peoples came from are dependent on the philology, the actual uh, names of their groups, and that can be very dangerous territory. The Shekelesh are frequently said to be from Sicily. Did they come from Sicily, or did they go to Sicily after they lost? For decades, scholars have argued over the origin of the Sea Peoples. Some point to southeastern Turkey, northern Syria, and the eastern Mediterranean as a likely launch point. Others contend that the Sea Peoples most likely came from Sicily, Sardinia, Italy, and the western and central Mediterranean. Do the Sea Peoples come from the east and move west, or do they come from the west and move east? We don't know. Were these really nine nations of foreign invaders? Or was this an attack that started much closer to home? One theory holds that it was the very structure of the ancient world that made it vulnerable to terrorism from within, 
a world built around palaces and omnipotent kings. The king would control most everything. There would be some private merchants and private enterprise, but mostly the king runs the government, the king runs the army, the uh, king is going to run the international trade, certainly in charge of the diplomatic powers. So um, you're in a, a situation where the palace pretty much controls 75 to 90 percent of daily life. In many places it seems the kings and queens lived with the gods. Uh, the kings and queens were the, the human representatives of the, of the deities. These deities are statues. And then there is the army, the professional army, under the kings and queens. And then there's everybody else. And uh, everybody else was supposed to keep and wanted to keep the gods and the kings and queens satisfied. The only place for laborers and peasants outside this system was in the king's massive armies. And even there, they played a subservient role in the service of the charioteers. The typical battle in the, in the late Bronze Age seems to have been the charge of two charioteries against each other. The, uh, each charioteer might be numbered in the hundreds or possibly the thousands. And the chariot crew was heavily armored, and that was the main weapon, the, the composite bow. And uh, so the, the fighting was mostly at, at long range. But of course, uh, after they'd hit a target and brought an opposing chariot to a stop, then somebody had to go and finish off that crew. And that's where the so-called runners came in, the uh, uh, barbarians who were hired to to act as cleanup crews uh, in a chariot battle. These anonymous groups of hired mercenaries were recruited from the poorest parts of the ancient world. The tablets that we have make it very clear that the, the palaces took very good care of the charioteers. They knew every charioteer by name, and uh, these people seem to have been an elite the runners seem to have been counted rather than named. They have so many hired from here and hired from there. There was a, a real difference in the social class of these people. As long as there was conflict, there was a place for these foot soldiers. But in the years leading up to the Great Collapse, there was an unprecedented period of peace. The country was more or less at peace because of the great treaty between the Hittites and Ramses II. It would be the equivalent of um, after World War I or after World War II with the various powers signing a, a peace treaty. This effectively brought an end to warfare between two of the greatest powers of the day. And we get um, know, half a century or so of peace. It, it certainly was one of the true high points of the ancient world and then it all comes crashing down. Did the fact that there was little employment for these lower class runners lead to an uprising? Or were these out of work warriors recruited by an outside enemy? And these warriors now without the central authority were either on their own or they were under the supervision of these local chieftains. They could do whatever they wanted. Nobody could catch them. The Egyptian record suggests it was a changing coalition that raided the power centers of the ancient world for over 50 years. We've got indications in the Egyptian records themselves that, that there were successive waves of sea peoples. Almost certainly there's uh, a, a change in the makeup of the group between the first and the second invasion. They're definitely working together as a coalition, but I don't think that they began that way. What we're seeing is the end result. It's the final wave that's washing up against Egypt. And as the Egyptian reliefs show, the so-called Sea Peoples were armed in much the same way as the native chariot runners. They were not uh, heavily armored. In fact, any kind of armor would have slowed them down and, and probably made them uh, less effective on the battlefield. And so um, they carried small round shields with 
leather over a wooden frame. And they wore a helmet. Um, I'm not sure whether the helmet was practical or not, but I think it had a good psychological effect on them. Though the exact origin of these warriors may never be identified, archaeologist Christoph Nowitzki thinks he has found one of the flashpoints. At Castri, on the coast of Crete, Nowitzki has identified remnants of a settlement unlike the many inland refuge sites he has explored. On this relatively accessible hilltop are the remains of battlements that to Nowitzki's eye suggest an experienced battle force. The people who lived here were not the normal farmers or shepherds. It's too dangerous. I mean, a small group of farmers couldn't defend it. Uh, any invaders, any raiders would easily take this, this settlement. The topography of Castri provides several strategic advantages, providing easy access to the coast of Crete, Italy and nearby islands. We may estimate probably two or three, four boats here, maybe about 50 to 100 or even 200 men, which was enough to invade, to raid the coastal places in Crete. If Nowitzki is correct, the Sea Peoples were not the last to recognize the strategic advantages of Castri. In the 1940s, this same hillside was taken by the Germans in their own attempt to dominate the island. But whereas the German troops were driven from these hills, the Sea Peoples overran Crete and the Aegean. The extent of destruction, especially at, in, in, in Anatolia, in central Greece, doesn't suggest to me a disorganized group, it suggests a rather efficient military machine. But whether this force represents outside invaders, disgruntled local warriors, or some combination of the two, the question remains the same. What's amazing about all this is that this ragtag group of marauders and pirates managed to knock off the best of the civilizations, and uh, how, how they managed to do it is, is still the major question. The answer may lie not in the origin of the Sea Peoples, but in their methods of waging war. 1,200 years before the birth of Christ, an inexorable force changed the very landscape of the ancient world. Evidence of its power was written in the toppled ruins of Mycenaean cities and the abandoned palaces of kings. The desperation of those that survived could be seen in the precarious outposts they built atop the mountains of Crete. Mighty civilizations, from the Minoans to the Hittites, survived pestilence, famine and earthquakes, only to fall to a human enemy, a mysterious force of barbarians called the Sea Peoples. But these invaders had no chariots, no armor. How could they have taken on the armies of kings? Late in the 13th century, it finally dawned on somebody that you didn't need these expensive chariots and chariot teams in order to win a battle. If you got enough runners together, and they were cheap, and they themselves have the capacity to annihilate a chariot army. One weapon made it possible for these runners to become formidable warriors. A simple weapon that until the collapse had been used primarily for hunting. The javelin is a fairly short weapon, probably four feet, and has a small metal head. I don't think that these were lethal most of the time, but they certainly would wound whatever they hit. As the raiders swarmed the disabled chariot, the well-protected charioteer would have been suddenly vulnerable. The charioteer and the chariot archer both wore a corslet with scale armor that might have weighed between 30 and 45 pounds. So obviously they cannot run um, and they are in no position to defend themselves in hand-to-hand -hand combat. It is at this point that a team of raiders armed with short swords and lightweight shields would have had the advantage both in numbers and mobility. 
That's all you'd need to do, wound a horse and that chariot is stopped. If they could, at 40 or 50 yards, hurl their javelins and bring down a chariot horse, then they were ready to come in for close combat and hand-to-hand -hand weapons, and at that point, the chariot crew is doomed. With every success, the ranks of the invaders grew and spread across the Aegean. Only Egypt was able to withstand the onslaught, although the conflict was to leave them forever weakened. So how did the pharaoh's armies withstand an assault that extinguished such powers as the Mycenaeans, Minoans and Hittites? There was a lot of diplomatic correspondence going back and forth and a lot of uh, trade in especially gold leaving Egypt through Nubia and things like horses being brought into Egypt and various other types of commodities going back and forth. So it was a period of a lot of communication between all of these powers. They had forewarning of these people coming toward Egypt, which is a very important aspect of defense. Uh, they had moved the capital of Egypt to the northern part of the country to actually to defend against these people, so they were very ready. I think there's a good chance that the Egyptians were also getting their information through diplomatic messengers and couriers from the other great civilizations as one by one they fell. I mean, there are amazing spy systems in place in the ancient world, and the Egyptians certainly had their group of messengers, spies, reporters, and so they knew what was coming before it hit them. And by this time, the Egyptians knew that contrary to their name, the Sea People's greatest strength was not on the water, but on land. The conflicts were essentially land battles, but Ramses III in 1179 had the good sense to stop these raiders, these marauders, from ever getting to land. The Egyptian records, both the pictorial and the textual, they depict a battle taking place on the water, whether it's in a river mouth or actually out in the sea, it's hard to tell, but we've got boats, we've got drowning people. There's obviously a major battle going on on the water. They were out there in their boats and they were helpless out there. Uh, the Egyptian archers who were stationed on the shore or on other boats, it was uh, duck soup. Decimated by the pharaoh's archers, the final wave of sea peoples was dispersed. But warfare would never be the same again. In the late Bronze Age, the defense of a community rested on an elite, on the charioteers and the chariot archers. In the Iron Age, which follows this catastrophe, the importance of infantrymen is much greater, and charioteers have, have become marginal. They uh, continue to be used for flanking operations, but they are no longer the essence. The essence is an infantry. In the span of just a few years, the kings and armies of the ancient world had been felled. In their wake, a new populace rose up. What the Sea Peoples do is create a power vacuum. When the Sea Peoples knocked off the top dogs of the late Bronze Age, they create a whole new situation. It's going to be the elite that go away, that are destroyed. The underclass, the middlemen, the farmers, the peasants, the slaves, they may well survive. And then what are they going to do? In the case of the shepherds and farmers seeking refuge in the mountains of Crete, the archaeological record is clear. After the defeat and dispersal of the Sea Peoples, the hardened survivors gradually returned to the lowlands. After 1200 BC, and as soon as the times became safer, people moved down to another ridge, which is about one kilometer, one and a half kilometer from here, lower and closer to their fields. Never again would they feel the need to build settlements at such heights. But the final fate of the warriors known as the Sea Peoples may never be known. The Egyptians themselves say that they settled some of the remnants in either Egypt itself or in Canaan. And we know that later Egyptian texts talk about the city of Dor in Israel 
being a Tejeker city. We know that the Pelesa settle down in Canaan. They become the Philistines. Some believe that these survivors and the remnants of the Sea Peoples may have intermingled, something future DNA testing of the remains found in the tombs may reveal. We've probably got remnants of the very civilizations that the Sea Peoples had destroyed while en route to Egypt. So we may well have Mycenaeans among the Sea Peoples, Minoans among the Sea Peoples, Hittites or Luca among the Sea Peoples, and it may well have been one of the few opportunities left to them was to join the Sea Peoples, the very group that had undone their civilization. And so the ranks of the Sea Peoples may have swelled with the very people they had just conquered. What is undeniable is that after the fall, something entirely new emerged. We're going to get dark ages for a couple of centuries as the melting pot is remixed. But up out of this, out of the uh, ashes, rise the phoenix of the Greeks. We get new political systems and new civilizations in effect. The Greeks rise up and we get things that will eventually become democracy as we know it. With the worst of motives, these sea people had destroyed one world, but obviously they opened up opportunities for people who'd never had opportunities before. We get the Israelites and David and Solomon, the kingdoms of Israel and Judah, which may not have been able to exist unless the mighty kingdoms of the late Bronze Age had been done away with. So the sea peoples, in effect, bring about the demise of the old and the rise of the new. The exact chain of events that brought an end to one age and gave rise to another is still being investigated. I don't think Christoph has the answer, but, but he's, he's, getting, he's getting close. He's getting close to finding the answer. What I think we've really got is, is a combination of causes. The Sea Peoples got lucky. Their timing was perfect. They take advantage of some of perhaps the natural disasters if a drought had occurred, if a series of earthquakes had just occurred, we get what archaeologists refer to as a systems collapse, where one or two factors, which in and of themselves would not have caused the collapse of civilization, when they're put together, create a magnification effect. The Sea Peoples are able to exploit a hole in the defenses of these mighty civilizations where none had existed before. As archaeologists sift the clues to this ancient destruction that occurred so abruptly, they may find modern insights as well. I rather doubt that the Egyptians or the Hittites expected they would fall, or at least fall quite so quickly. But when you get a series of factors that might not otherwise be related, they could come together to create a force more powerful than each of them individually. So one of the lessons we might learn for today's society is that while a drought might not be important in and of itself or while a series of earthquakes might seem to have only a lasting impact, if you layer a couple of natural disasters on top of some man-made calamities, you may get a completely unexpected result.